Welcome fearless viewers, to another chilling tale from our realm of horror. Tonight, we delve into the darkest corners of the human psyche, where shadows lurk and fear reigns supreme. Before we begin, make sure to subscribe to our channel and join our growing community of horror enthusiasts. Help us reach our next milestone of 700 subscribers, as we continue to uncover spine-tingling stories that will haunt your dreams. Now, brace yourself, as the journey into the unknown begins. In Sussex County, Delaware, there is a road with 13 curves. This is near the Broad Kill River and Slaughter Beach. Yeah, I know great names, right? They were named that for a very, very legitimate reason. Rumor has it that the road that has 13 curves is, because it goes around the burial grounds that are said to be there, and they're said to be incredibly haunted. These are 90-degree curves. People around here tend to stay off it after dark. I believe it was either Netakoku Indians or Sequoia Indian tribes that inhabited this area. They were both here at one point, and I do believe they're still here now. Anyway, on to the way home from Philly on the 13th of September, 2017, my daughter and her friend wanted to go down the road. They thought it would be fun to do the 13 curves on the 13th, of course, I said, okay. It was around 7.30 or 8 p.m. when we arrived. That's when it all started. I've been down that road before, so I know how to get there. It took me roughly 5, maybe 10 minutes to get to it. I thought it was a bit odd, but when we found it, it felt like the air went ice cold, so I had to put the heat on. Okay. No big deal coming up to the first curve. I look in the mirror and wonder where the car that was following us had came from. There had not been a driveway or a street or anything like that, and this car kind of just like popped up out of nowhere, but they were driving extremely fast. I looked back at the road, back at the mirror, and then the distance was cut in between us, like almost in half, like it was going so stupidly fast, it's like that ninja cat video. You know, the one with the person is recording his cat hides behind the wall, looks back and the cat is closer. Same type thing this person is going to crash, I said to my daughter, I again, looked back at the road, back in the mirror, and the headlights were at my bumper. Now how fast does this guy even want me to go again? I looked at the road back in the mirror, and when I looked back, I had no idea where he went. It was like if he turned off or something like that but we would have seen flashlights, headlights, whatever. You know, it was pitch dark out here. There are no street lights anywhere on this road. On the right, there were cornfields on the left, there are trees, with a salt marsh. Like I was thinking maybe he had crashed or something like that, but I obviously hadn't heard any noises just then, three mist traveled opposite directions, in front of the car, two to the right and to the left, and one off to the opposite side of that. Okay, at this point, it's time to get out of here. But I couldn't really see out the windshield very well. It wouldn't be clear with the wipers and fluid. It just for some reason, was dark. The more I used the wipers, the worse it seemingly got. Now we're all starting to freak out. We finally left that area, and it took us about 15 minutes to get out of there, no matter how far we went, we ended up back at the 13 curves. Now mind you, I don't ever get lost. So my daughter pulls out her GPS and tries to get us out, and the GPS just kept taking us back to 13 curves. Now this is getting a little too freaky for me to handle. I finally found an area I knew and started driving back toward the highway, or so I thought, guess where we ended back up? Yep, 13 curves. Once again, back to the GPS. We looked for any route to get to the highway, and it says that we're going back to the 13 curves every single time. Something said, just keep going straight. And then eventually we got to the highway, and the GPS seemed meanly was accurate again. I'm not really sure what was going on, but it was definitely a very creepy time. Now I can tell you this, it was about 6,570 degrees, so it was a rather pleasant night. It was out in the rural area of Delaware, and I can't tell you much more than that. Don't touch the shadows by night. Tales. My story takes place at my grandma and grandpa's house, 
as for a little backstory. The house was built in 1943 in an old neighborhood. It was one floor with three bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, a porch and a gigantic backyard. The three rooms were down a long and narrow hallway, which always creeped me out. My grandparents' room was at the very end, and my room, which later became the laundry and guest room, was right across from it. Then there was Nikki's room, my older cousin, who was 11 years older than me, across from the bathroom at the start of the hall was the living room, and in the front was the kitchen. I was about four years of age at the time. I'm 14 now, so I was afraid of the dark. I had to use the restroom in the middle of the night, so I grabbed my Disney Princess flashlight from my toy bin and headed down the hall. I got shivers from the AC my grandma had turned on. I finished my business, turned off the bathroom light and clicked my flashlight on. I was right at the door frame and something caught my eye. It was already blacker than the pitch black of the house and it made it stick out. It was not the mistake of something shining off anything or a trick of positions, what I saw was a shadow of a person at the end of the hall, the exact end of the hall where my room was at. I was frozen with fear. My heart pounding in my chest for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. The shadow started to fade, and I made a desperate run from my room as I passed the spot where the being stood. Seconds before I felt something grab my arm, I tripped over a toy, panicked and jumped into bed, throwing the covers over my head, as if it would be some sort of protection. That's the last time I got up in the middle of the night in the house. I, this lesson is for everyone who may be reading this and is sane enough to believe me, never touch the shadows. For 13 years, my home, nestled in southern Delaware, enveloped me in a serene, woodsy embrace. A 15-minute drive wound through quiet lanes to the nearest small town while the closest small city beckoned, 40 minutes away, surrounding my house, a sprawling nature preserve punctuated by the occasional hunter's cabin, offered a playground of adventure. As a child, I spent countless hours exploring its hidden corners, forging trails through thickets and underbrush, one area held a special place in my heart though a secluded expanse of abandoned fields and pine forest about a half mile from my childhood home accessible only by a rugged vehicle trail, this sanctuary boasted a tiny pond shimmering amidst towering pines, large pieces of concrete fence cordoned off its perimeter, preserving its tranquility from motorized intrusion. The place was sacred to me, a haven where I had often unearthed treasures like unique rocks and intriguing animal bones, nurturing my fascination with natural history. Years later, I returned with my fiancé, eager to share this enchanted row, the forest greeted us with its timeless embrace, sunlight filtering through the canopy to dapple the earth and patches of warmth. We ventured out towards the familiar pond, tracing the vehicle's trail, winding path with renewed anticipation. Our search for natural curiosities began innocently enough, but soon took an unexpected turn. Amongst the pine needles and mossy ground, scattered remnants caught our eye, bones, fragments of what I would assume were deer skeletons, lay strewn in a small clearing, some pieces gleamed white against the forest floor, stark against the backdrop of deep green. Intrigued yet uneasy, we examined the remains, partial skulls, rib bones, and vertebrae laid out within a six-foot radius. These were not the orderly remains left behind by some hunters who typically fuel-dressed their kills elsewhere in the preserve. No these were fragments a mysterious puzzle of decay and something that defied an easy explanation. Disquiet settled over us as we knelt amidst the eerie tableau of the forest, which once hummed with the rustle of leaves and distant wildlife, now seemed hushed unnaturally still gone were the familiar echoes of distant trains that occasionally cut through the air, leaving a silence thick enough to touch unease crickling at our senses. We exchanged nervous glances, what exactly had brought these scattered bones to this secluded haven? Who or what had laid them out so deliberately defying the natural order of the preserve with a mutual understanding, we abandoned our search and hastened our way back along the trail, footsteps quickening as if eager to leave this mystery behind. The once familiar woods, now draped in shadows that seemed to whisper ancient secrets, urged us toward the safety of my car driving away the weight of the unexplained hung heavy in the air. 
We vowed silently that that eerie clearing undisturbed was best left alone, its mysteries unsolved, a haunting reminder of the thin veil separating the known from the unknowable in the heart of the wild. My creepiest experience by Anonymous, whether we accept it or not, we all have experienced something creepy, weird, or even paranormal. If we accept it or not, you see a dog. You blink. It's not there. You hear things banging. When you're home alone, doors move, voices talk to you. A ghost possesses you, old ladies, or teenagers who aren't there. We've all seen it. It all has to start somewhere, and mine is probably the freakiest I have been through, or anything like that. Anyway, my first experience with the paranormal was when I was just seven years old, luckily or unluckily, I have a sharp memory of it, and I remember it well in my old house, my parents wanted me to understand God well, since we were Christians, so they got me a tiny angel doll that lights up at night. The last time I liked that thing was day one. It was creepy and too bright to fall asleep. And anyone reading this can agree that any doll is weird, especially lifelike ones. It's so lifelike, it has such a humanoid face, but a fake chest and arms. So after I learned how the technology actually worked, I quickly unplugged the doll with electricity from the plugs and fell asleep. I dreamed of something chasing me and promptly woke up in a sweat with my heart racing. I looked around the room and noticed light flooding in a weird fashion. After looking around curiously, it dawned on me where it came from. Then a thought occurred, I, I did unplug the light, right? But the doll didn't want to be unplugged and it was glowing brighter than it ever had before. I did what any sane person would do, I hid under my covers. But then another thought came over me that I only understood once I learned about ghost, the doll typically changes colors, like peaceful ones, like green, yellow, blue, etc. But this time, it stayed on one particular color. It was pure red, which still freaks me out to this day. After that horrid night, I dared to ask my parents to get rid of the doll, and they admitted that it creeped them out as well. So I put the doll in my closet and the heaviest object in my room over the door and an old bean bag chair in front of that just for extra protection to make sure it couldn't get out. That night, the doll also didn't want to be locked away. I saw shadows walking by and whispers that I couldn't make any sense of. After that experience, I had nightmares at four wheat and every now and then I would see the shadow of that angel. I prayed and hoped that they would go away and my prayers were answered. We moved out and gave the house to some obnoxious neighbor. At the last minute, I thought I had removed the doll and left it there, but three years ago, I was rummaging around in my new house when I found the doll. The logical explanation is my parents found it and put it back. But I have a hunch that it wasn't the case. I think it's something more paranormal. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Maybe it's my imagination. Maybe it's something more serious. Let me know in the comments if you want me to tell you more about my ghostly experiences. Mary Allen was a 73-year-old widow who had lived alone in her residence on Governor Prince Boulevard for many years. This was a smaller city known as Claymont, Delaware. She was known for her kind heart and dedication. Mary was a beloved figure in her community. She had a green thumb and took pride in her garden, where she spent mornings tending to her roses and other plants. Her garden was a source of joy and beautiful testament to her hard work and passion. Mary's life was marked by routine and simplicity. She was a reliable and punctual employee, which made her unexplained absence from work on the morning of July 24, 1975 all the more alarming. Despite her advanced age, Mary maintained an active lifestyle, often seen by neighbors, walking around her yard or chatting with friends. Her friendly demeanor and open-door policy reflected her trust in the community, a trust that would ultimately be betrayed in. On the morning of July 24, 1975, Mary's absence from work raised immediate concerns her employer, knowing Mary's impeccable attendant record became worried and contacted her son to inform him that she had not shown up. This was out of character for Mary, who was known for her dependability. 
Concerned, Mary's daughter-in-law wanted to check in on her arriving at Mary's home around 4 p.m., she found the house eerily quiet. As she entered the home, she called out for Mary, but received no response. Her heart pounded as she made her way through the house, finally reaching the bedroom where she discovered Mary's lifeless body. Mary Allen was found in her front bedroom, brutally stabbed to death. The scene was gruesome, and it was evident that she had been attacked with great violence. The investigation revealed that her killer, or killers, had entered the house through an unlocked back door sometime between 8 p.m. on July 23 and 10 a.m. on July 24. It appeared that Mary had been initially attacked in the bathroom while she was getting dressed. She was then dragged to the front bedroom. She was then repeatedly stabbed despite the ferocity of the attack. There were no signs of any SA and nothing appeared to have been stolen from the home. This absence of theft or essay added to the mystery and even more horror of the crime, suggesting a deeply personal motive or a level of brutality that was inexplicable to those who knew her. The investigation into Mary's murder was challenging from the start. To say the least, neighbors reported hearing nothing unusual during the night, and there were no witnesses to the crime. One neighbor mentioned having a brief conversation with Mary the evening before, nothing that she seemed, you know, unnormal. She said that they were more concerned about the potential need to move her beloved roses due to the street widening plan than anything else, Mary's trusting nature, which led her to often leave her back door unlocked or ajar, unfortunately, provided easy access for the killer. The lack of defensive wounds suggested that Mary might have been taken by surprise, unable to fend off her attacker. The murder of Mary Allen sent shock waves through the tight-knit community of Claymont. Residents were horrified that such a violent crime occurred in their midst, especially to someone as well-liked and respected as Mary. Her death left a void in the neighborhood, and her garden, once a vibrant symbol of her presence now stood as a silent reminder of the life that had been so brutally taken. Vigils and memorials were held in her honor, with many community members coming together to support her family and call for justice, despite efforts of law enforcement and outpouring of community support. The case grew cold over the years, but no significant leads or suspects emerging. Mary Allen's life and tragic death remain a poignant chapter in the history of Claymont. Her story is a reminder of the fragility of life and importance of a community though her killer was never brought to justice, Mary's memory lives on in the hearts of those who knew her and in the flowers that continue to bloom in her garden.